Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, special interview that Orinoco Tribune has with uh, uh, our friends from the Nicaragua Solidarity Coalition in the U.S. Today, we have the pleasure of interviewing Barbara Larcom and Rita Jill Clark Golub. Uh, they are active members of the Nicaragua Solidarity Coalition and the uh, and the Friends of Latin America uh, group in 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 the U.S. and they do an amazing job uh, trying to present a different reality uh, of what happened in in Nicaragua and try to create some synergy solidarity between the U.S. people and the Nicaraguan people. So welcome, Barbara, and welcome, Rita, to our interview. Um, before Thank jumping- Thank you for having us. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. it's great to have you. The same to you, Barbara. It's great to be here. Thank you. And, and I'm, before jumping to the questions that we have, uh, I'm going to read a, a short bio for Barbara and for Rita that I believe are, is important for people to know uh, what they do. Um, Barbara Larcom is the current chair of the Nicaragua Solidarity Coalition, an international alliance of organizations and individuals who support Nicaragua sovereignty. She also coordinates Casa Baltimore Lima, a friendship project uh, linking Baltimore, Maryland with San Juan de Lima, Nicaragua. She has led numerous delegations to Nicaragua, to which she has traveled 26 times over the past 35 years. So she is an expert on, on, on Nicaragua. And the same thing with Rita. Rita Jill Clark Loop is from a, a U.S. Nicaraguan family and has lived most of her life in the United States. She is active with the Maryland-based Solidarity Group Friends of Latin America and serves on the coordinating committee of the Nicaragua Solidarity Coalition. She organizes study tours to Nicaragua and has published uh, articles with the Council of, of Hemispheric Affairs, Popular Resistance, and Counterparts, am among others. So today we're going to talk about Nicaragua, and but before jumping to the question, I, I want to tell you that I don't know if that happened in the country in Nicaragua, but here in Venezuela, our right-wingers, at least for the last two years, has been using this expression, Venezuela is becoming the new Nicaragua. Oh, great. And, and I am like, what? <laughs> What is this? I mean, like if Nicaragua is something bad, but they are using that expression a lot. And I'm I, I'm sharing this with you, wondering if in Nicaragua they say that the, the right wingers say the same about Nicaragua, be, you know, somehow becoming the, the new Venezuela. <laughs> because I, I haven't. Uh, but, but because I they say it in, in, in bad terms, you know? <laughs> like if I haven't heard that expression, but I would regard I would regard uh, that as a compliment to Venezuela if it's becoming the new Nicaragua because that's Nicaragua a, is a wonderful country. It's doing a, it's making progress. <laughs> that's a that's a good point. Yes, exactly. That was uh, what I want, wanted to say. I mean, we, uh, we hear that from the Miami lobby. You know that uh -huh. the three are so terrible, and we hear. In Honduras, they say, oh, it's going to become another Nicaragua. Yes. I think the fact that the um, that the Venezuelan opposition is saying that means that maybe the uh, smear campaign against Nicaragua is the Miami, better than, and the, than Miami the smear campaign against Venezuela that day. <laughs> yes, yes. And the Miami connection of all right wingers, my, I believe that might have an influence on those nonsense comments but anyway i wanted to share that with you because they have been doing that at least for the last two or three years if you ask mm. me uh, which is something incredible especially taking into consideration how nicaragua uh uh behaves uh uh especially in respecting human rights especially in you're not trying to promote change, but anyway, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that up to you. Jump into the first questions, which is, um, it's not a question; it's just a, a, a an issue that I want you to, uh, I want us to talk about. I mean, what what is the current political and economic um, situation in Nicaragua? What are what are the the most current developments uh, in political and economical issues in in, in the country? of Sandino? 
Would you like to start, Barbara? Um, I'll start, but I'm glad this is going to be a conversation so that we can interweave our comments. Yes. Um, I believe, or what I see also uh, from traveling to Nicaragua and being there a few weeks at a time, is Nicaragua is doing very well in, uh, in terms of uh, the government taking the limited resources that it has, but using them in a very smart way to uh, provide the best possible conditions, living conditions for people there. And as part of that also, that they ask the people to participate. Uh, so there's a lot of participation in the building of the country. But in terms of the resources, they're using them uh, to promote the human rights, for example, human rights to education and health care, gender equity, um, and things also like infrastructure, where they're building highways so that people in the rural areas can bring their products elsewhere and, and be connected to the rest of the country. Um, so that's the positive. And at the same time, because Nicaragua is uh, continuing to be independent in terms it, it wants to maintain its sovereignty and develop relationships with countries everywhere in the world to the extent possible. And if there are uh, countries like the United States that are doing a smear campaign, then uh, they kind of inch away from those countries and pivot instead toward countries with which they can, they can do more. Um, so I'll stop there. I'm sure Jill has a lot to add. Oh, sure. Um, and one thing when I know that um, Jesus wants to talk about the smear campaign because he, he's from Venezuela, and we're talking about Nicaragua, two of the countries that have been so horribly maligned with false narratives in the mainstream media. But um, whenever we do talk about Nicaragua, we have to be careful that we don't get so carried away with the, this game of whack-a-mole of responding to this lie and that lie and the other lie that we forget or we don't spend enough time and energy telling all the good things that are happening in the country. So I fully agree with what, um, because that's also part of this smear campaign is to prevent, to suppress the good news coming out of these countries and um, make us just devote our time to refuting the lies. So, but I, I want to strongly echo what Barbara was saying um, about programs to improve health care and women's rights and infrastructure and all these kinds of things. And one thing that comes through very clearly um, and consistently from the Nicaraguan government is that their biggest enemy is poverty. And this has been a government over the past uh is it 17 years now? Yes. Um, that has really been doing everything possible to combat um, poverty and hunger and um, uh, infant mortality, um, you know, uh, preventable deaths. So um, in these past uh, 17 years, uh, this, this is a country that has been historically one of the poorest in the hemisphere and in which there were high rates of malnutrition. And um, uh, I think it might be useful to talk about a few things that are unique about the Nicaraguan revolution. Um, I know you have a very well-informed audience, um, Jesus, but just to refresh people's recollection, the, the Sandinista revolution um, Actually, the Sandinista Front for National Liberation was founded uh, shortly after the triumph of the Cuban Revolution, and then it in turn triumphed in 1979. And it did follow many of the great examples of the Cuban Revolution in terms of prioritizing education and health particularly. Um, but some unique things about the Nicaraguan Revolution were that there was a very strong um, a very strong peasant movement and a very strong cooperative movement. And this was handed down from the tradition of Sandino resisting 
the um, invading U.S. Marines in the 1920s and 30s. But so Nicaragua never uh, sought to be a complete socialist revolution. It was always a mixed economy with a lot of um, small businesses, small farmers, and co a big cooperative movement. Another thing unique about Nicaragua is that um, the Nicaraguan Revolution came about sort of side by side with the liberation theology movement in Latin America. And so actually Christian-based communities that were based on um, you know, the new attitude under Vatican II and liberation of poor people they were part of the social movements that brought about the Nicaraguan Revolution and were very active in the 1980s. Of course, the Catholic Church hierarchy was very much against all of that and played the traditional conservative role that it had played in so many countries. Um, and um, so uh, fighting, so this is all to say that um, uh, land reform was a big thing in the 1980s and that had been rolled back during 16 years of, almost 17 years of neoliberal government, but that came in to the fore in these past 17 years. And rates of uh, child malnutrition have gone way down and uh, more and more uh, people have uh, titles to their land and the food sovereignty movement is really thriving in Nicaragua. And another very unique thing about Nicaragua is that from the FSLN's um, program for the country uh, set in 1969, it established that there would be work to improve the lives of people on what was then called the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua, where there's a majority Afro-descendant and indigenous population that were uh, a time colony of the British, so it had a different development history. And in fact, in the 1980s, those through social movements with the people in, in those regions and an extensive consultation process, they changed the constitution and established autonomy for those regions. And those indigenous and Afro-descendant groups um, own one third of the national territory has been deeded to their communities and they have um, regional governments and territorial governments. They had elections um, recently, right? And they had elections last uh, March. Yes. And over the past two decades, in every election, the FSLN wins more and more favor. The, the FSLN actually got its highest in the national. The, these elections that were on March 3rd were the... Um, for the regional authorities. But in the national elections for president, the FSLN, and Barbara was in one of those regions, she can tell you firsthand, um, the FSLN got some of its highest votes in the North Caribbean coast uh, region. So those are the things that are going on in Nicaragua. I mean, every day there are new hospitals, new hospitals are being built, more health clinics, um, more programs to bring health and and other social programs into schools. It's uh, um, it, society is really transforming in a very positive way. And another thing that is unique about Nicaragua in the region is that it's very peaceful. It has very low rates of crime. And in fact, the homicide rate in the U.S. is is just about the same as Nicaragua right now. Seven point around uh, seven per one hundred thousand population. So Nicaragua is doing relatively well, even though it's, as Barbara said, you know, it's a poor country and making progress, but um, things are, are moving ahead uh, really impressively in Nicaragua. I believe that is so important, to... that background that, that Jill has provided us. Go ahead, Barbara. I was just going to add to what Jill said about uh, my participation in the 2021 elections. I was one of 10 people who traveled to Bilui, uh, also known as Puerto Cabezas, and that's in the Northern Caribbean Coast Autonomous Region. And so we visited, I believe it was four, it was at least three different uh, voting locations and watched how uh, the elections were being administered there. And uh, so we were able to see lots of people coming, especially first thing in the morning. Uh, toward noon, a, a lot of that tapered off. But um, And they were very efficiently then directed to the appropriate classroom. Most of these um, 
most of the voting takes place within public schools, occasionally a community center. But um, then each classroom, just as in the United States, is uh, geographically uh, assigned, like one of our precincts or something. And so on the uh, side of the classroom, um, each, each classroom had a list of the eligible voters for that location. And uh, so then after people vote, then they get their thumb stamped so they can't vote a second time. But within the classroom itself, then they have representatives of each, uh, each of several political parties who are all monitoring the elections together and cooperating to make sure that uh, no particular party uh, pulls any fast ones or anything like that. And there is secret uh, voting. And then afterward, then uh, they actually count the votes that have been cast right there in that room. And they, uh, they write down those tabulations and they make several copies. And the, then those, uh, the tabulations for their room are put on the side of that classroom, passed along to the voting location to be added up with the others. And then that whole process continues uh, up to higher levels across the country. So there are, there's lots of cross-checking of voting counts and the ballot boxes are sealed and preserved so they can be double checked as well. I know that's a lot of detail, but I wanted to point out how well the elections are administered. And that's just one more aspect of the smear campaign uh, that supposedly the, uh, the elections are a sham. They're not a sham. And uh, they, correspond, they correspond also very well with the, um, the polls that were conducted prior to the elections where it showed that the FSLN was doing very well and it was expected to. So again, it all uh, corroborates that, that finding. Um, okay, so that was about elections. I went on about that a little more longer than I expected, but <laughs> it gives no, you a sense of how well they're done. I also wanted to talk for a moment about education. Uh, of course, we just, our coalition just had um, a webinar about that a week and a half ago. But one thing that I wanted to mention is that as soon as the FSLN came back into power in 2007, one of the very first things that it did, I believe it might have even been on the first day, was to overturn the uh, practices and policies of the previous three neoliberal administrations and declare that education would be free and provided to all and that is from preschool through university, through graduate school, through professional schools. Um, so it's remarkable in the United States, we should be so lucky. Um, and they're able to do that because the government uh, budgets its money very, very well. It uses its money and allocates it, uh, a lot of it to education. And they regard that as a high priority so that the people of the country then become well-informed citizens who were then able to participate in their society in a, a very strong kind of way. That's important. That's important. From what you just said, uh, there are several things that come to my mind. The first one is that uh, uh, I, I'm just learning from you guys that... that of that, that special autonomous uh, condition of the um, of that area uh, where the election mm -hmm. happened, and w when I was reading the recent news about that election, I, I was wondering why why they had like only elections in that part of Nicaragua, and now I understand. I mean, uh, uh, from what you uh, just said, and and I believe that's important for people to to know. Uh, because not everyone has all the knowledge that you, as experts on Nicaragua, have on, on, on that issue. So another thing that is important from what you both just said is that it's very similar. Uh, uh, I'm not saying that it's exactly the same, but uh, what happened in Nicaragua to what happened in Venezuela in terms of uh, not complying with the step-by-step Marxist recipe, 
you know, mm -hmm. on how to take power. I mean, in Venezuela, I believe that as well as in Nicaragua, we has been, uh, we has, we have decided to go the hard way. I would say, uh, in terms of you know, uh, having a more complex political scenario, or so I believe that that's something that have to be highlighted because sometimes you have to deal with some Marxist purists. Mm -hmm. that try to 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 put a finger on Venezuela or maybe on or maybe that happened also to Nicaragua in terms of that we are not Marxists and that we are not going to socialists because we didn't uh, create a, a an only party system right. and things right. like that what, what what would you say about that I, I would say that that's a reflection of the fact that both revolutions are very much rooted in their own reality yes. and that the people, uh, that it's not dogmatic formula that's driving what's happening, rather it's a social movement. And um, yeah, I was thinking uh, uh, there's been so much talk about the church in um, in Nicaragua. That's another, uh, That's we can get into that when we start talking about smear campaigns, but yes. um, I just read the um, a, a book about the history of, of a Christian, a set of Christian-based communities, and um, they said that, one of them said that they met Carlos Fonseca in the 1960s. He was the, the leading founder of the Frente Sandinista de Liberación Nacional, and he said, so I want you, he, he was talking to the Christian-based communities who they already had been allied with the FSLN. And he said, so if we want to be dogmatic Marxists, we could say that all you Christians have to become atheists and then you can become revolutionaries. But how about instead you just be revolutionary Christians? And that's really what they all, what they all did. Yes, that's a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> Especially from what you just say that you know that the religious movement in Nicaragua have play a role in the revolution. Mm -hmm. In the case of Venezuela, I believe that it's not exactly the same, but I, I cannot say that religious groups are there always trying to influence government decisions. But uh, but but I believe that in the case of Nicaragua, uh, it's more evident the role that play this religious group in the revolution and the shaping of the Sandinista revolution, I believe. Uh, and I believe that that's somehow different from, from, from our case here in Venezuela. But anyway, another issue that, that I believe that is important to highlight is that uh, of the gender parity, mm -hmm. which you, some of you mentioned briefly, but that, uh, that I read that was very active in these recent elections in the uh, in, in 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 Nicaragua. So, so what would you say about that? Especially now that we are about to celebrate the 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 women's uh, international, international women, women's working day. women's day, mm -hmm. right? Well, my understanding is uh, that for every level of uh, running for office, for example that it's required that there be a, a roughly equal number of candidates of each gender dividing into t only two genders. Of course, we know that's nuanced too, but anyway. Um, so for example, if you have a, a male running for mayor in a given town, then the, uh, the vice mayor has to, uh, the candidate for vice mayor of that party has to be a female and that has to be that's true for all parties it's a requirement right. in other words right. uh, we, yeah. have, we have not achieved that in venezuela i mean the the psub in venezuela has been trying in recent years to push that uh 50 50 uh formula in terms of 50 candidates should be woman 50 percent i mean and the other 50 percent should be men but 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 we have not been able to push that through the whole system through the national electoral council and i believe that's something we that we have to copy from from nicaragua so it's my my oh i'm sorry barbara go ahead or oh, just just to finish up that point just so it results then in having uh pretty much half of uh, the, the people holding office are women and half are men. 
uh, in, including up to the level of the National Assembly. Um, That's important. So, yeah. That's important. Oh, and one more thing about that, just that um, Nicaragua, each year, of course, all the countries in the world are ranked uh, as to their level of gender equity. And Nicaragua continues to be ranked very high. I think it was ranked fifth one year recently and more recently seventh in the world. Yes, I, I've seen those years and it's, it's amazing. I believe that's once I saw it in second place, or maybe maybe I'm confusing, but 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 anyway, no. being in fifth place or seventh place is good enough. And it's it's been the the highest in the Americas for for uh, a number of years now, um, so it's usually right after the um, right after the Nordic countries. But I think there are one or two other countries in other parts of the world. Okay, that's important. You wanted to say something, Jill, uh, a few seconds well, ago. Well, sure. Um, it just. And and as as far as Venezuela looking to this, Nicaragua had a um, had passed a law for gender parity, which basically means every um, any party that runs a candidate. Uh, just just to clarify it a little bit more, um, for every position, they have to have equal male and female. So, like Barbara was saying, if it's a, a mayor and deputy mayor, there has to, you know, we, a party's candidates, have, one has to be male and one has to be female. And it, I think it was about eight years or seven years to gradually move towards fully implementing that. And when Barbara and I both observed elections in 2021, it had finally been fully implemented. And there were some uh, political parties that are aligned with the US that complained about that because they didn't have enough women to run as candidates. But um, that's right. So uh, uh, let, now, now that you are mentioning the, 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 the opposition parties, I mean, what are the, the, the most important opposition forces currently in Nicaragua and how relevant they are? Um, you know, uh, there are lots of, um, I am not an expert on the political parties and there okay. are lots of alliances. Um, Barbara, do you have more info on that? I think I could call something up. Um, right. I would have to call it up too. I know that the constitutional liberal party, for example, is, uh, I think probably the major, um, opposition party. In terms okay. of how many seats it holds in the National Assembly, right? Um, okay, okay. And and that party, uh, do you have an idea? Or, or you don't have to have it. I'm just curious. You have an idea of the of the ideology of the party, or how how they connect with the former, uh, you know, anti Sandinista groups that well. Well, there are some uh, former Contras from the 1980s that okay. have reconciled with the FSLN and that regularly participate in alliances with the FSLN. Okay. So, And it's funny, as somebody wrote after the 2018 coup attempt, um, uh, where one stood in the 1980s or where one's political uh, alliances lied in the 1980s was not a, as good of a predictor of where they would stand against something like a coup attempt in 2018, but rather um, economic, socioeconomic class was a better predictor. And so um, there were people in the FSLN government in the 1980s who were from wealthier classes because uh, in the overthrow of the Somoza dictatorship, um, it was an alliance of different parties, and some were against the dictatorship, but not necessarily against the kind of capitalism that prevailed in Nicaragua. And those people, little by little, gradually dropped out of the government over the course of the 1980s. And then, and then of course, there was a split in the FSLN party in the 1990s, um, a split amongst people who were primarily from the wealthier classes and well-educated, I mean, educated outside of the country. They tended to be people who spoke English and who had more contacts with international solidarity and sometimes with other 
Latin American uh, left groups. Um, and they they were advocating more a party that could win elections. So there was a struggle between that group and a party that um, uh, the FSLN that remains that that wanted to be more of a social movement. And it was the social movement Sandinistas that were, you know, there with the people in the street um, protesting for money for education and for health care and for food sovereignty and for to protect land reform that came back. Um, whereas the others, the others, so um, there's the MRS movement that ha seems to have more support outside of Nicaragua than inside Nicaragua. MRS. I imagine, yes, the MRS party. Yes. Okay. And um, they got, I think, in an election in the 1990s or around 2000, um, maybe got once five or six percent of the vote. But they, in the yeah, past uh, 20 years, they haven't gotten more than like 1% of the vote. They're very small. But we hear their perspective all the time from in the U.S. mainstream media. Mm. and um, But they don't have much support within Nicaragua. But there is a wide variety of parties. And I was just looking um, to see the ones that participated in saw, the I, in regional the recent, in, in the recent regional elections, I saw like like five or six. I, I believe that I recall the, the constitutional party that you just mentioned, that, that you first mentioned, uh, like the second force, I believe that, that mm -hmm. got votes, but I believe that the yes. FMSL, uh, I mean, the LPMSL, <laughs> as we say in Spanish, uh, the Sandinistas, I mean, I got like 85% or something of the votes, I believe, right? Right. Yes. I I just found what I was looking for. The Liberal Constitutionalist Party got 7.83% uh -huh. of the vote. Yeah. The Partido Alianza Liberal Nicaragüense got just less than 2%. Another one got uh, less than 1%. And the PLI is 0.76%, um, whereas the FSLN yeah, got uh, well 80, over, 80, eight, like 88% 80 of the vote. Yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Well, that's important. And it's also important to know that, that those elections are, I mean, happen because of this autonomous nature of this part of Nicaragua, which is something that I did not know. Yeah, so if, if I may, um, and the FSLN alliance has like eight, seven or eight parties within it. So it's not just the FSLN. And just to add to what um, Barbara was saying about when she observed the elections in the North Caribbean coast, I, I heard other people that were in her group saying things like people told them, you know, we had two major hurricanes a year ago. Eta and Iota in November of 2020, which um, killed a, a thousand people in Honduras that we know of, but it hit land in Nicaragua. It hit hardest in Nicaragua and nobody died and everybody got moved by the government and everybody got put in shelters and everybody got help uh, re, uh, rebuilding their houses if they needed that. And um, and that's why the, that that region got the highest percentage of the FSLN vote. And they and we have new highways. They've been connected to the rest of the country, which is important for commerce and tourism and having access to hospitals. They're getting new hospitals. The North Caribbean coast is the site of what is going to be the biggest hospital in the Central American Caribbean side. Um, it should be concluded sometime towards the middle or second half of this year. They have universities. And, the, and so whereas before, people weren't getting adequate education. And then if they got education, they had to go to Managua to get, you know, sometimes even to complete high school. Now they not only have to get, they don't have to get educated in Managua, they get educated in their own region. And so they have doctors and educators teaching and administering medicine in people's own languages with sensitivity to their own culture. And they practice what they call intercultural education and intercultural medicine. So not only uh, do you get the benefits of Western medicine and modern facilities, but you also can have your own shaman there, your own traditional healer, your own midwife. 
And that, that's been really important. Another way that Nicaragua has helped women's rights is by tremendously reducing maternal mortality. In the first 15 years after the Sandinista Front came back into office in 2007, maternal mat mortality, uh, I forget uh, what the rate is, if it's per 100,000 births, but uh, it went down by from 99 to 33. So it was cut by That's two thirds. Yeah. And the maternity weight homes are a big part of that. So these maternity weight homes that are um, scattered all around the country are places where women in remote areas and women with high risk pregnancies can go for at least a couple of weeks before their due date. They can get good nutrition, they can get rest, they get um, child rearing lessons, they get lessons on entrepreneurship, and they they have their baby they're right next to the, they're right next to the hospital so they can have an attended birth. And attended births in um, you know, the second or third poorest country in the Americas are below 3%, which is really pretty good. And yes. maternal mortality is still declining, whereas in the United States now that is unfortunately going up because that's of right. so many cuts to our social services and health system. Yes, that's terrible. And on the economic side, I mean, I know that, that I mean, in, in, in all over the world with the pandemic, uh, all the, the, you know, the, the economic indicators went down and then after the pandemic, they went up like that, like, like, a, they, they, like a, un rebote, we say in Spanish, a rebound. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. But, but, but how is that, uh, I mean, how did that behave or is behaving in Nicaragua? Because I, I, I understand that it, mostly in Central America, that's what happened. The pandemic came, the GDP went down a lot, then the pandemic finished, the, G the GDP moved up a little bit, but uh, most of the countries in Central America has been like stagnated uh, uh, since then. And I have to add to that, that uh, some Central American countries like, like Nicaragua, as you mentioned, where uh, has been also affected by, 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 you know, the climate change and, and the hurricanes. Mm -hmm. And how is, do you have any idea of how the, 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 the GDP has been behaving lately in, in Nicaragua? Um, yes, well, I'll start. And I'm, I know Jill can add to this. Um, during the pandemic itself, Nicaragua made the conscious decision, uh, policy decision not to close down. In contrast, for example, I believe El Salvador for a time um, closed itself entirely. And they did that because they saw that people needed to continue going to work in order to have money to just eat, you know. And uh, but at the same time, they tried to promote uh, public health policies that would minimize the damage health, speaking in terms of health, to people in the country. And so they were uh, they went door to door educating people uh, about how to uh, to the extent possible prevent contracting COVID uh, and that kind of thing. And they provided uh, health care to people. Uh, if people did become positive, then they were uh, they were instructed to stay in their own homes and they had health personnel checking on them, that kind of thing. So as a result, the uh, yes, there was economic damage to the country as there was damage to all the countries in the world during that period. It, it was a tough period. Um, and so things did go backward a bit uh, in terms of economic development. But immediately afterward, um, because they had suffered less health-wise and, and ec economically than some of the other countries in Central America, they were able to pick up the pieces more rapidly. And uh, they really have, uh, Nicaragua has done very well economically since that time. Uh, there has been quite a bit of growth uh, and unemployment is at something like 4%. Uh, the inflation rate is low. Uh, so the, the country, economically speaking, has been managed very well. It's good to know that. It's good to I know think that. that's a good summary, Barbara. I could just add a couple of things. Um, 
I should point out that Nicaragua um, is has a low population density. It has the um, one of the smallest populations, but the largest land area in Central America. And because of the earthquakes, it doesn't have a lot of high rise buildings in the big cities. And so unlike Venezuela, where I understand there are a lot of apartment buildings in Nicaragua, people are more spread out. And that's also worked to Nicaragua's advantage during um, during the pandemic. But other Central American countries might have tried that, but particularly Honduras and and El Salvador, as, as Barbara said, had dr very drastic shutdowns and people suffering hunger. But that's not that was also true in Guatemala and Colombia and other countries. Um, so so it did not and it did not incur the big debt that, for example, Honduras and El Salvador incurred during the pandemic. And hearing to the Minister of Finance and other Nicaraguan officials talk afterwards, they said, oh, the, the pandemic was bad, but the the 2018 coup attempt, that was like five pandemics. The the coup attempt is what really, really hurt the economy, lost uh, like um, 100,000 jobs and, uh, you know, know GDP negative, 10% negative GDP growth. So they handled... Um, Eta and Iota very well, the, the big category four and five hurricanes. They handled the pandemic very well. They also, um, we should mention, have one of the lowest excess death rates from the pandemic, uh, according to the World it Health is. Organization. Um, so, uh, but it's, it was, they are, I think they have come back to where they were economically really dating back from the coup attempt that's been the big that's important the long i didn't know that it's impressive that figure that that you just mentioned about the 2018 coup attempt being five thousand five times uh more damaging to the economy than the pandemic that's that's something that's an, a figure mm -hmm. anyway let's jump to the work that you do I mean, can you explain the, the audience uh, what you do, how you do it, where you do it, how to contact you? I mean, that kind of information that I believe is important uh, to spread out. Sure. I think you're talking about delegations. So maybe Dele I should, the, the, the whole, maybe the, I the should whole go Nicaragua sure. Solidarity maybe, Coalition maybe work and the delegations. Yes. Yeah. So, but since you asked about delegations, maybe I'll go first then, Barbara, and then you can talk about the delegations that you do as well. Well, but, I think he's not. He was asking about the coalition, right? Yes, right. Work yes. The also the coalition. Oh, okay, sure, sure, sure. The, the sure. coalition work, uh, and I believe that within the coalition, the delegation is part of it, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So um, we have um, the uh, Casa Benjamin Linder. It's named after a young American who was killed by the Contras in 1987 but it's been a solidarity house and it's it's a it's a hostel and they organize wonderful tours and it's led by somebody who is also on the coordinating committee of our delegation Becca Rank with the Jubilee House community she writes and nice by the way yes yes and she has lived in Nicaragua for over 20 years and very much in a, in a, a grassroots community and has a really wonderful perspective and so they organize delegations to look at health care. Uh, that's what they've traditionally done. In more recent years, they've done delegations to look at women's rights that have been very successful. And I collaborated with them. We did it. We, um, you can go to casabenjaminlinder.org and um, see under their resources, their study guides, uh, we put together a virtual course about women's rights in Nicaragua, and more recently, um, a virtual course about the autonomous regions on the Caribbean coast. And we have a delegation coming up in April to visit both the North and South Caribbean coast autonomous regions. And- When the delegation um, is gonna happen? Well, that delegation is filled up, but that's okay. going to be in April. Um, but there are other delegations are being planned. And then uh, Barbara does leads uh, lots of work for the coalition. So maybe I should let her step in. Um, yes, 
to back up a, a bit, yes, delegations are one aspect of the work of the coalition. We have a number of others. I'll start by saying that uh, the coalition is not just based in the United States. Uh, it is an international coalition, and we have a coordinating committee. At, at the moment, there are nine members of the coordinating committee, and uh, even they are based in several different countries. Uh, some in the United States, some in um, in Nicaragua, one in Mexico, uh, one who is kind of a roving person. She started in Bolivia, but she's now in Nicaragua herself. Uh, and we're uh, wanting to add someone from the UK. Certainly, in terms of our participation of the larger membership, we have uh, people in the UK and even uh, to a smaller extent, other parts of Europe and uh, and other uh, places in Latin America. And we're hoping to, um, it's it's open to everyone. So for example, the webinars that we conduct, we, we do get people participating in those from all over the world. I'm surprised sometimes when I see the countries that they're, um, they're coming in from. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of other aspects of the coalition, uh, Part of it is just providing the infrastructure to keep all of us together. So, and we're fairly new at all of this. We're about a year old, really, uh, in terms of deciding on our name, deciding on a logo, getting our um, our website up and running. In fact, we're revamping the website now. But the the intention, which is partly fulfilled, but we're we're growing at this is to provide a resource for people to use to provide all kinds of accurate information about Nicaragua, partly to counter the smear campaigns, but partly just so people can get as excited as we are about how wonderful Nicaragua is in so many different ways. And so we're uh, gradually developing our listing of articles that have been written, our webinars, um, our database of people's so that we can keep in touch with them. Uh, the, in terms of the people who are on our coordinating committee, uh, we each have our own areas of specialty. For example, um, I'm helping a lot with the database as well as um, being one of the moderators of the webinars. Uh, we have a couple of people who are working on media and social media. Uh, Jill is wonderful when it comes to overall strategy and also she does a lot of work networking with allies as well as participating in leading some delegations uh, so uh, we have a we have one or two specialties in the coordinating committee and yet we're all meeting and working together and bouncing ideas off of one another um, we have then our monthly general meetings at which we um, ask anyone who wishes to to uh, to speak about what Nicaragua related activities they're working on, asking for help from others, et cetera, and just in general trying to overall promote a lot of participation in the coalition. Lisa. And we have a weekly newsletter. And okay. we would love for Orinoco Tribune's uh, followers to join us to get on our mailing list. And there is also the Alliance for Global Justice is a close partner of ours, and they publish the weekly NICA notes that's been going on for decades. Yes, yes, that's important. Yes. Thank you, Jill. I should have mentioned uh, the uh, the name of our website. So people can go there and check it yes. out at any time, and it's continually updated. So it's nikasolidarity.net. Okay. And our email address is similar, but it's not quite the same. It's Nicaragua Solidarity Coalition at gmail.com. Okay. okay. So okay. if you uh, want to ask a question or find out how to get to the next meeting or sign up for anything, just write to that. So I'll repeat it one more time. Nicaragua Solidarity Coalition at gmail.com. And our next monthly meeting, by the way, if anyone is interested, um, is going to be this coming Monday, March 11th at 2.30 Eastern time. We meet on the second Monday of each month. Let me, let me ask you something. Uh, because you 
you know, you, you are doing this job and, and you are based in the U.S. and you interact with people in the U.S., uh, how do you uh, value or me measure the the change in U.S. people perceptions about Nicaragua? I know that that might be a hard question, but but maybe because you uh, are in contact with people in the U.S. might have an idea on how U.S. public opinion or U.S. youth uh, response to all these smearing campaigns against Nicaragua and the reality of Nicaragua. Do you have well, an idea about that? I know that is not an easy question, but maybe you have, a, and that you might not be able to measure it, uh, you know, in, in, in concrete numbers, but maybe you have a, an idea, like a, a hunch. Well, I I think that one thing is that um, what you hear in the mainstream media about Nicaragua, just like about Venezuela, is so drastically different from what you see going to the country. So when we manage to get people to visit the country, sometimes even just as tourism, and actually Nicaraguan tourism has really picked up a lot over the past year or so. And there, are, and because the word has gotten out in tourism circles that Nicaragua is inexpensive and interesting and safe, um, and even some articles have come out about women travelers traveling alone finding that they feel safe in Nicaragua. So, but you know, we we try to get people to come on study delegations to deliberately learn something, and we've had a really um, high success rate. We almost always have people coming back enthusiastic about Nicaragua. Um, a majority or maybe half getting involved in solidarity work and the remainder at least not believing the mainstream narratives anymore because it is so different what you see in the country. I have to I have to tell you, you that are. that two of Edito, Orinoco Tribune editorial members have participated in delegations in Nicaragua and they have come back like rejuvenated they they are you they, they are young by the way but they mm -hmm. uh, has been come back like uh, over excited from what they learn in these tours to nicaragua so that's and they are young people so so i believe that 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 youth that, involved that... in this contact with uh, solidarity organizations like yours uh uh is important to have them and you know, and see the reality, you know, right. Know. It is, it is very important. And we continuously try to reach out to them. And actually, there has been a, a number of young people gone. And they're also um, very inspired by all of the Nicaraguan youth who are engaged. And um, like, for example, Barbara and I went uh, to observe the elections, the voting age is 16. I couldn't believe how many young people were volunteering at voting centers. Where, where I live in the United States, people think we have a great democracy and the youth is so disengaged, they see no choice to even vote for. Um, and yeah. you see the, the youth at, at Sandinista rallies and demonstrations and just very excited, a lot of energy. I, I didn't know that, that the, the voting age was 16 in Nicaragua, or maybe I forgot. So it's <laughs> overall 16? Yes. 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 Oh, that's amazing. We tried to do that with the constitutional reform that Chavez proposed in 2007, I believe. That that but that proposal was rejected in the referendum. I mean the, mm. the whole proposal, not that mm -hmm. one in particular, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So no one has, you know, bring back that initiative uh in Venezuela. But I believe that that's what we should do. I mean I I'm not certain, but I think that was instituted in the 1980s. I do remember the wow. population was even younger in the 1980s. It was like half of the population was under 15. So it made sense that you should allow more people of the that demographic to be able to vote. And they've continued to vote and be very engaged. And, and I will say that um, after the the um the coup attempt i think there's been a, an awareness that political education 
especially amongst the youth, is extremely important. Yeah. And I can remember when the first delegation that I ordered that I organized in January of 2020, I, I heard that there was a group of um, of peasant youth uh, social media awareness group or something like that, you know. And I thought I asked them to speak to our group, and I thought that they would be talking about oh how you can tell something's fake on social media and how you this and that. No, what they do is just basic political education because if you understand how the world works and who's on your side and who's against your side si against you you are much better prepared to understand where these non sometimes things seem nonsensical and that's because they have a hidden agenda yes. and so i think yes. that's been very widespread in the country and i really um, love, I, just... I, I hope that in the us that that might happen also you know because having kids voting might help a little bit. I know that more radical things need to be done in the U.S. to to change the, the political landscape. But anyway, go ahead, Barbara. Sorry for interrupting you. I'm sorry I interrupted you. Um, I just wanted to add a point about uh, delegations. Um, there was a, a recent delegation of, I think it was all women, but anyway, they were exploring the role of women as protagonists in Nicaraguan society. And this took place in, in January. And on March 24th, there will be a webinar at which we'll have a report back from four of the people who were on that delegation. So we invite people who, who see this to participate in that webinar and learn more about it. Yes, that's important. It's important, especially because people that come back from these delegations, they usually, as I mentioned, they, they come back rejuvenated, I mean, with the baterias cargadas, as we say yes. in Spanish. Uh -huh. How do you say uh -huh. that in English? They're, they're recharged. Yeah, they recharged. get recharged. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes so that's true. Another area, uh, important area of our work is... Um, Unfortunately, we have to fight against the U.S. sanctions being ratcheted up against Nicaragua. The sanctions are not nearly as bad on Nicaragua as right now as they are on Cuba and Venezuela, but yeah. we see them continuously ratcheting up and we know where this is headed. So our coalition, um, particularly in the United States, has been lobbying Congress and also against the current, and, and we can share this information if you have viewers in the U.S. about what we're doing about... Yes, most of our audience is from the U.S. and oh, Canada. Oh, okay, great. By the way. So um, uh, there's a, a bill in the Senate and now in the House of Representatives. It's Senate Bill 1881 and House Bill 6954, and we want people to contact their members of of Congress to tell them that we don't want this. And there's a very cynical um, debate going on in the U.S. Congress. It's uh, It seems that the Democrats have become a little disenchanted with sanctions because they've finally gotten the message that sanctions drive migration. And the migration crisis has come to be a political liability for the Democrats. And because the migration crisis is a political liability for the Democrats, the Republicans just love the migration crisis. And oh. that's that's a Trump's favorite talking point. And so the Republicans don't want to solve the migration crisis. So we're very puzzled why a Democratic senator, Tim Kaine, who's one of the leaders of the Democratic Party, is a co-sponsor on this bill. And we encourage any of your listeners to contact his office and tell him that he should not be um, trying to punish the Nicaraguan people um, with sanctions. And these sanctions would add um, coffee and beef to the products that are the uh, that could not be imported into the U.S. from Nicaragua, would prohibit any U.S. investment in Nicaragua. And it also seeks to take steps to kick Nicaragua out of the CAFTA Dominican Republic um, free trade agreement, which was generally, you know, free trade agreements are not very good for the the smaller People. countries that are incorporated mm -hmm. into them. But this was put into place before the Sandinistas came back into power. And Nicaragua very cleverly 
I don't know the details of how they managed this, but um, Nicaragua managed to consolidate its food sovereignty during these years and is a net exporter of food to the rest of Central America and even to the United States. And to Venezuela. And, uh, and to Venezuela. Uh, uh. And so uh, one, if it would be a violation of the other Central American countries' sovereignty to to force them to kick Nicaragua out because that's what would have to happen. It's but it could point. also could also it's... cause food crises for the other countries. And um, and the U.S. is uh, it seems like the U.S. is kind of mad that Nicaragua didn't just give in to the big food companies because that's what often happens is that countries become dependent on food imports. And you see this in Costa Rica. They were food self-sufficient some 40 years ago. And now they, they had a lot of small uh, peasants like Nicaragua has now, but now they've all gone over to being, you know, pineapples, just uh, exporting pineapples and not growing the food that the population needs. So, but Nicaragua didn't do that. I believe that what you, one of the most powerful arguments that you mentioned was is the one related to, to migration, because mm -hmm. that's a sensitive issue in the U.S., so I yes. believe that that's a that might be a good strategy, a good argument to push an strategy against more sanctions and more because in the case of Venezuela, uh, the impacts of the sanctions on migration has been incredibly high. And the U.S. people right now, uh, even politicians, I believe, are realizing that. So I believe that that might be a good in terms of production or things like that i believe that the gringos do not pay attention to that because i mean we have oil in venezuela mm -hmm. and the gringos the gringo capitalistic machine needs that oil but they don't even care about that i mean it's so it's so illogical uh the way the the imperialist machine works that they don't make rational decisions and i believe that's why they are right now coming back to Venezuela, uh, uh, as we say, con el rabo entre las patas, mm. uh, trying right. to find uh, political negotiations between Chavismo and the opposition here in Venezuela. But in reality, what I believe is happening is that the gringos need energy. And right. they realize that these crazy sanctions against oil in Venezuela backfired. Uh, mm -hmm. especially after the Ukrainian crisis. And that's right. another issue. Right. But anyway, that right. takes us to our last, the last part of the conversation, which is how to deal with this. And I believe that we are already there. How to deal with these smearing campaigns, how to deal with sanctions, how to deal with this campaign against socialism, Sandinism, and Chavismo, which is what you are just saying, right? I mean, like, like, pushing campaigns like the one that you are doing, trying to to lobby against initiatives like this one in the U.S. Congress, right? Yes. Um, do you want to talk about human rights, Barbara? Because that's part of it, too, and that's something we haven't touched on, and that's mm -hmm. what we have a new sign-on for. Okay, uh, I will do that, but I think I'll preface it by um, trying to answer the question just asked, which is, some of the, the the overall approaches that I think our coalition is trying to use. One is the coalition itself is a coalition, but it is also aligned with other coalitions. On, uh, for example, the Sanctions Kill Coalition, uh, which of course did a wonderful set of um, tribunals last year. Uh, and so by by spreading the word about sanctions more generally and how harmful they are to all countries, that helps us in terms of our work with Nicaragua as well. Um, okay, so then moving on to uh, what Jill was suggesting about the United Nations, this is the second year in a row now that uh, something called GREN, which is the Group of Human Rights Experts on Nicaragua, has published a report uh, su supposedly uh, summarizing human rights violations in Nicaragua. And um, so this report just came out again this year, 
Last year, we put uh, quite a bit of effort into protesting the first report that they did because we believed that it was so biased, so so one-sided, it um, and it accepted many of the claims of the opposition at face value without probing any more deeply to see whether they were even true or accurate. Uh, and never taking a look at the human rights violations of 2018, for example, of the opposition violating the human rights of the thousands of people who were uh, killed, injured, and so forth by the attempted coup. Uh, so last year, we put a good bit of effort into protesting uh, that report and we provided a lot of evidence for what we were saying, three different annexes, uh, and all of this was submitted to the group of human rights experts on Nicaragua, as well as the human rights, uh, UN Human Rights Council. Uh, got no response at all, except for one, I think one person sent back an email saying they received it. Um, no response ever. Now they've put out another report where they have not acknowledged anything that was submitted to them as evidence from us from last year. And they're repeating the same kinds of uh, claims without even going to the country or, you know, or having any kind of first uh, hand evidence. So we are not putting as much energy this time, I don't think, into uh, our our level of opposition because it was ignored last year anyway, but we do want to at least protest the way they're handling this and how biased and in their inaccurate they're being. And so we do have uh, a new uh, Google form that just went up last night, which people are encouraged to sign to protest this latest report. And I've created a bit.ly in other words, a shortened URL that I help will uh, I hope will help people remember how to get to the form, even if they have to memorize it. So it's bit.ly and then a slash, uh, Nika UN 2024. So bit.ly slash Nika UN 2024 will get them to the form. They can read first the statement of why we think the report is so terrible. And then they can sign at the bottom so that uh, we will collect a list of signatories to it. In the meantime, we already have uh, Alfred Desaias, who has, he's a, an internationally recognized uh, human yes. rights expert. And he has already agreed to sign it. And he um, is quoted in, in our protest statement. That's nice. That's nice. It's complicated to deal with this campaigns because they are like prefabricated you know they they just right. uh, you know reproduce here and there all the all the negative narrative the washington white house narrative against whatever opposed their dictates or i don't know how to say it uh, but the same thing happened with venezuela and i believe that what you mentioned uh, uh, at least in this particular campaign uh, against this legislative uh, initiative in the U.S. Congress, I mean, the whole migration issue, and and of course, the, the economic issue is important also, uh, uh, you know, the one related to the to the impact that yeah, that san new sanctions might have on, on, on countries uh, like El Salvador or Central America or the Caribbean countries, so so I believe that you should that that that's a good strategy, uh, but uh, but it's hard to fight with these campaigns because they are massive, and even in in outlets like Orinoco Tribune, we try to fight against you know those things, but it's a fight of David versus Goliath. I mean, it's, right, right, it's a monster that is you know waving the war. But I believe that we do our part to try to counter the and, and I would just like to say that I think um, the world is changing and I think that um, more the, the the global south and the BRICS countries are becoming 
more aware that they represent the majority of the world's population. And a divide is being created between the US, the NATO countries, and the NATO allies, and the rest of the world. And we saw that in how they did not all jump on the bandwagon to impose sanctions on Russia in the Ukraine war. And we see how that is this, um, all of the contradictions are being laid very stark with the Gaza war. And we have the global South leading the defense of the Palestinian people. And Nicaragua in is participating actively uh, there. And I, and I admire that yes. because I haven't seen Venezuela yet. I mean, Venezuela have made statements, but I believe that Nicaragua have moved forward in terms of doing something concrete in the International but, Court of Justice, but, right? But yes, but that is an area that Nicaragua is particularly suited to. And if I could take just a minute, um, you've probably heard about um, the when Nicaragua took uh, the U.S. to the World Court, the, the ICJ, in the 1980s for the Contra War and the bombing of Nicaragua's harbors, and Nicaragua mm -hmm. prevailed, but then the U.S. never paid the reparations. And uh, Nicaragua has been asking, has revived the request for the payment of the reparations last year. But um, it, since the 1980s, Nicaragua has maintained a presence at the world court and has the same agent who argued the case against the United States is still there, uh, Carlos Arguello. And okay. he has a lot of experience. Nicaragua has uh, litigated several territorial disputes since then with neighbors with which it generally has good relations. Um, and even with Colombia, because mm -hmm. Colombia is laying claim to Caribbean waters recently, but going back like 30 years. I mm -hmm. think actually maybe even to the 1980s, there's been disputes with Colombia. And so... Um, the San Andres Island. Right. The San, uh, yes. San Andres and Providencia, mm -hmm. yes. Um, but uh, yeah, so the World Court has had to sort of clarify access to the territorial waters because it's really on Nicaragua's continental shelf and, and all of that. But there have been, uh, it's been the Gulf of Fonseca, where Honduras, El Salvador, and Nicaragua all touch the water. There, there have been several disputes. So, um, uh, uh, when the international coalition to stop genocide in Palestine came and met with the um, the Nicaraguan embassy in Washington, like they met with so many embassies to try to ask countries to join the South African suit to basically file a uh, what's it called a um, hi, I'm forgetting the the declaration of intervention. I believe it's called something like that. Mm -hmm. um, Nicaragua was already on the way to doing that. And um, so Nicaragua has already, uh, I think, with at that point they had expressed. For, first, they have to ask the offending country to stop doing the offending behavior, and they had taken that step. And then they they formally gotten to the stage of formally requesting that. And then you're probably also referring to that on this past Friday, um, Nicaragua uh, filed a case against Germany for uh, yes for assisting in the genocide, both for helping to arm Israel and for cutting um, funding for the UNRWA, the UNWA, that is the, the lifeline for the people in Gaza right now. And um, it's it, a lot of people ask why Nicaragua didn't file suit against the U.S. for aiding and abetting the genocide. And that's because the U.S. is not a full party to the genocide convention. They filed a reservation and it would be um, would not go forward. There, there was an, another case where the court all, already said that it did not recognize the U.S. as a full party to the Genocide Convention. But they, they put um, not only Germany, but also the U.K. Barbara, can you rem uh, help me remember the other countries? It was four countries, Canada. And was the other one the Netherlands? I'm... I don't remember. Anyways, there were four countries that Nicaragua asked to stop aiding genocide. So we'll see if there will be cases against them as well. That's important. I believe that is important step that I really I think that non Latin American countries have take in that form. I mean, uh, with that uh, level of 
commitment and responsibility as the Nicaraguan people has been doing. And, and, and that's something that has to be applauded, especially under the you know levels of atrocities that the Israelis are doing against the Palestinian people in recent months. Yes. And so I think, you know, uh, it's becoming more apparent to the world which countries respect human rights and which ones don't. And yes. I so, believe that uh, the Palestinian crisis has been an eye-opening event for many people. And and also, as you say, the, the, the Global South has been reshaping and the BRICS emergence uh, mm -hmm. represents a change also in the international landscape. Uh, and, and, and it is true. I mean, the, the U.S. hegemony is in, I believe that is entering in a phase of decline that that we are still to, I mean, that we are going to see more scenes in the coming months, uh, you know, um, as an evidence of that. Uh, uh, and, and that might help, you know, uh, us, especially countries like Nicaragua and Venezuela to to present our truth uh, in a mm -hmm. different way and to try to to make the world see that all the atrocities and the lies that the U.S. and the, its propaganda apparatus spread all over the world are not necessarily true and are mostly lies, mm -hmm. at least in the case right. of Nicaragua and Venezuela, right. I believe. Yes. Thank you guys for accepting the invitation. I don't know if you want to add something to what we already talked about. I'm 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 very honored to have you and I invite you to 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 count with Orinoco Tribune uh, if you want us to help spreading the word that you do. We already do uh, a lot of uh, spreading of information about Nicaragua, but uh, whatever you think that we we should do, uh, please Share it with us. And please say something uh, if you want to add something uh, before cutting the transmission. Well, I just want to say thank you for in including Nicaragua in your work and thank you for having us here today. And I'll let the the leader of the coalition have the last word. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I can't do much beyond that myself. I, I also thank you for uh, this opportunity to share an exchange with you. And uh, I look forward to learning more about how we can continue to work together. Thank you. That's great. That's great, Barbara. Thank you, Barbara. And thank you, Jill, for joining que, us. Que viva la solidaridad entre Nicaragua y Venezuela. Que viva. 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 Un abrazo. Un abrazo. Un abrazo. Thank you.